Our program today, Surviving and Thriving, is being presented by Andrew Oberly. In June of 2012, while conducting his anthropology master's research in South Africa, I can hardly say that, you're doing the research, Andrew was viciously mauled by two adult chimpanzees and nearly lost his life. After two months of fighting for his life in the Johannesburg ICU, he was flown home to the United States and began his long journey of recovery. After dozens of surgeries and countless hours of rehabilitation at St. Louis University Hospital, Andrew discovered his new life purpose. He was asked to lead the development and implementation of a trauma survivor support program at St. Louis University Hospital. Andrew's presentation takes attendees, all of us, on his journey from surviving trauma to helping others thrive. He emphasizes the importance of recognizing humans experiencing the complex difficulties that accompany tra trauma survival and how important compassion is in helping them in the face of hardship. Andrew is a St. Louis native. He obtained his Bachelor's of Arts in Sociology degree at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas, his Master of Arts in Anthropology at the University of Texas, University of Texas, San Antonio, and a Master's of Health Administration, Management, and Policy, and a PhD in Public Health, all from St. Louis University. He lives in St. Louis with his family and currently serves as patient experience partner for Barnes Jewish West County Hospital. So please join me in welcoming Andrew Oberly. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for, for having me here. This is my very first time to this campus. Beautiful, beautiful campus. I drove uh, down from uh, West County in St. Louis, got to drive down Highway 21. It was remarkable. It's, yeah, those, those leaves are starting to change. It's, it, was, it was beautiful. And, and, and like uh, my, my lunch mate over there said, no, no billboards the whole drive down pretty much. And it was, I'm going to have to make this drive again. But uh, I just want to, Introduce myself. I'm Andrew. I'm almost almost finished with my PhD, so I'll get there soon. Uh, I'm in the data collection phase, so I should graduate uh, this December if all goes according to plan. So I'll get there. Thank you. And it, and it, it really will be a culmination of this 11-plus uh, year journey that I've had now. But, you know, as you'll see here, it actually, the, my journey uh, really started um, in second grade uh, when I first learned about Jane Goodall and all that she did to teach the world about chimpanzees and how amazing these animals were and you know how intelligent they are, how beautiful they are, how their families work together and treat each other. And it was something that I went home and told my mom that afternoon, I wanna work with chimpanzees the rest of my life just like Jane did. Uh, so I spent the rest of my, my young life going to the St. Louis Zoo uh, and and really doing all I could to be around chimps. I would go run to their enclosure when I'd get there. I'd watch the documentaries on TV. I even remember watching them, you know, stick a, a stick into a termite mound and uh, lick the termites off. And then one afternoon on my front porch, I saw some ants crawling on the porch. So I grabbed a stick, licked it, and got a few ants. They bit my face a little bit, but I survived. <laughs> Uh, but it was, uh, I, I just love chimps. I wanted to have everything I could to do with them. And as I got older, I started working at the St. Louis Zoo in the education department, learning more about animals. They're really also learning about conservation because without conservation efforts, we can't keep these guys safe. Uh, and that led to working with chimps for the first time when I was a, a zookeeper intern in college. And then that led me to graduate school down in San Antonio where I started working on my master's degree in, in anthropology, really focusing on chimpanzee behavior and conservation. And that's what took me to uh, this wonderful sanctuary in South Africa in 2012 where I was finishing up my master's uh, thesis project it, uh, with these beautiful animals you see here on the screen. Uh, I was really living this dream that I've had since I was eight years old. Uh, but one afternoon, uh, a couple of the big guys got out of their enclosure and really taught me a lesson. So this is just to give you an idea of what an adult male chimp looks like. You see those big teeth, those big jaws, those huge muscles. Uh, that's Nikki right there. He's one of the guys that eventually got out and got me. Uh, but they're big. An adult, you know, you see these chimps 
you know, that, that you see on, on the screen previously or the ones you see on TV, cute and cuddly, you want to hold them. You, you know, you see them on birthday cards or on the old Tarzan show. And, and you don't think about what they turn into when they get a little bit older. But adult males, you know, when they get about 11, 12, they really start to bulk up. And by the time they're 13, 14 years old, they can be five times stronger than a person of the same weight having these huge teeth. I've seen a chimp take a, a fully grown coconut, bite onto it, and pull it right out of its husk. I mean, these, these guys are strong, and they really know how to bite. And unfortunately, I learned that the hard way. Andrew Oberly is in critical condition, though, this morning after the chimpanzees he was working to protect turned on him violently. And ABC's John Muller is here with much more on this story. John, good morning. This is tough stuff. This is tough stuff, Dan. He was attacked by the animals he loved so much. And this morning, Andrew Oberly remains in intensive care, fighting for his life. So that was a story that some of you may have seen on the news 11 years ago. It went all over the world, uh, which... I'm thankful for, uh, for the most part, of course, you know, the, the notoriety being the guy who was attacked by chimps isn't, you know, something that, that uh, it was hard to, to deal with at first. But all the things that came out of it really have made my life what it is, this life I'm so grateful to have, and, and you'll see why. Uh, but that, that, was, that was the story that um, my mom had circling through her head when the doctors told her to get to South Africa as soon as she could but not to have her hopes up that her son would come back with her alive. So these are the two guys here, Nikki and Amadeus, two adult males at this sanctuary that I loved. Um, and that afternoon, I was near their enclosure uh, leading a tour group. The big guys, you know, I'm there standing, standing tall, talking loud, and, in, you know, and in the chimp world, uh, a strange male coming up to your territory where you also have your your chimp girlfriends with you is can be considered a sign of aggression. And at least in my education, uh, I learned that, you know, that's my best guess on, on why they decided to try to teach me a lesson for being there. So these are the two guys, uh, you know, still I see their faces and and I can still see their faces on that afternoon. I remember most of the attack. Uh, I was alone with them from what I'm told for about 20 to 30 minutes, you know, I'm, uh, it was, it's a big sanctuary, so the time it took for the people who were with me to find somebody who worked there, and then for those people to get their weapons, get in their truck, and then come find me, it was 20 minutes of first me trying to get away. That didn't work. And then me screaming and begging for them to stop by name. No, Nikki and Amadeus, please stop. And they just kept biting and beating and tearing and, you know, holding me down. And it really, it, when I figured that you know, all I can do is try to survive. I just curled myself into a ball and just took it until they were able to get me. You know, I, I can still close my eyes and really, you know, I can feel that hot breath on my face right before they bit my nose off. I can feel a crunch. Sorry for the folks who are still eating. A uh, little sensitive material here, but uh, uh, we'll get past that soon. And I did not include any medical pictures because you are eating. Uh, so uh, hopefully that'll, that'll help. Uh, I can still feel a crunch on the back of my head when they bit that and took a little piece out of my skull. Uh, you know, I remember being held down, kind of pinned down by one of them. The other one was grabbing my fists, which I had clenched up, and pulling my fingers back one by one. This little piggy went to the market style and then biting them off, going to the next one, biting it off. And by the time that, that the attack uh, ended, I couldn't see at that point because uh, they had bitten a lot of my scalp, kind of torn that up. And I remember just feeling, I, I remember feeling the sensation of being lifted in into what I learned then was the ambulance slid into the back. Uh, I was uh, asked if I knew where I was. I remember saying the name of the sanctuary, and then everything went black. And uh, all my family, my friends, and strangers around the world we're seeing these types of articles pop up. And, you know, I can only imagine what they were going through. My friends, you know, I, I was living with my best friends at that time uh, when I was a student, and, and this, is, this is what they saw, and they were trying to communicate with my family in St. Louis, and then my mom and dad flying over to South Africa, trying to keep in touch with the folks over here, all with these stories all over the news, uh, with news 
vans, news, you know, news organizations trying to interview anybody in my family that they could, trying to get pictures of me at the hospital, having to sneak my mom out of the back there. Uh, it was, that was the negative side of this story going so viral. But things did go well. Because this story was kind of, you know, so sensational, you know, I, I woke up in a hospital two weeks later. I was put in a medically induced coma, and this is what my parents saw when they got there. Me laying in this bed attached to tons of machines, doing everything for me, including breathing for me. I was on that ventilator for about a month. I was um, in South Africa for two months altogether in that ICU before I was strong enough and my doctors would clear me to go home. They, the chimps had ripped off a lot of my scalp, my ears, my nose, nice big gash on the side of my face that caused a little paralysis. You know, if I, if I smile, it's not symmetrical. Uh, I can't close my eye all the way. At first, I couldn't even hold liquid in my mouth, but some great therapy helped me kind of close that gap. Uh, as you can see, they, they took a lot of my fingers, just left me my, my thumbs, and then the one finger that, in my opinion, is the most important for my story. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's not the middle finger for the folks in the back who can't see all the way up here. But uh, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see later why this finger is important. Uh, I had a collapsed lung. Uh, I went into septic shock several times. They took a lot of chunks out of my, my abdomen, my backside, my legs. I'm missing half of my right foot, about a quarter of my left foot. Uh, it, it was not, I should not be alive standing here and, and sharing the day with you all because it was not pretty. But for some reason, which I, I feel that I have the answer to that now, uh, I was kept alive. And I slowly started recovering from this, from this scene here. And things started getting a little brighter for, for my future. I still, you know, at first couldn't talk over there because I was on the ventilator. I was in such horrible pain. They were changing my dressings daily for four hours, and it was absolute torture. But I started seeing little glimmers of hope. So I had my friends back home sending me pictures. This is my, my dog, Angie, who I miss terribly. She passed away a couple years ago, but my mom hung this picture at the, at the, uh, at the bedside so I could look past all these bloody bandaged uh, bodies and missing pieces and see my, see my girl there uh, telling me to, to come back home soon. Uh, my friends in San Antonio were starting to throw benefits for me uh, at, at, at bars and at other places. They even got bands to play a benefit concert for me to raise some money. They, they held mouse races here in St. Louis. I'm from the Epiphany of Our Lord Parish, if anybody's from the St. Louis area. Uh, I grew up there, went to school there. My grandpa was deacon. They held benefits uh, there in the gymnasium. My friends started selling these just little $5 cause bracelets, which I still wear to this day, Operation Oberly, as they called it, uh, and just started raising money for me that way. And, and I was hearing all this, and it just made me feel, you know, like, like I could do it. Like I had people there cheering me on and all these negative thoughts that were going on in my head. Like, you know, I, I wanted to give up. There were so many times where I just said enough, but I had people rooting for me. And when you have hundreds and hundreds and maybe even thousands of people telling me that I could do it, that they're praying for me, it started to really influence my mind and let me know that maybe I do have a chance. So I'm going to fight, I'm going to hold on, and I'm going to go home and, and, and thank all these people. And then even bigger glimmer hope, I found out that there were some folks at St. Louis University Hospital, my hometown, uh, fighting to bring me home. Helen here on the left was the director of the emergency department. Uh, she had a, a small connection to our family, and she went to the president of the hospital and said, if we don't get Andrew home now, he's not going to survive. He she found Dr. Bruce Kramer, who was our chief of plastic surgery, brilliant, brilliant, compassionate surgeon who loves a challenge. Those two got together and made the case for me, and uh, shortly after, I was flown home. Uh, so I spent four more weeks at St. Louis University Hospital in acute care, not ever getting out of my bed, but them just going through surgery after surgery after surgery. I've had 28 altogether uh, since this, the majority of those in that first couple of years that I was there. Uh, but mostly under the care of Dr. Kramer there, who for some reason from the minute I met him, trusted him completely with my life. Then I spent six more weeks at the Rehab Institute of St. Louis, which is right there connected to, to De Barnes Jewish Hospital. And within... Uh, about four weeks of not getting out of my bed for th over three months, 
I was standing up at parallel bars. I took that first step, which I never thought I would do again because I even had doctors tell me, you might not walk again. If you do walk again, you'll never run again uh, because of the damage to, to your feet and to your legs. Uh, my ankles also fuse, so that just adds that extra complication. And I was a marathon runner before I got hurt, so hearing that news was just extra devastating to me. But, you know, we all take standing and walking for granted, uh, you know, until we can't do it anymore. But standing up at that parallel bar that first time, regardless of the pain I was in, I could, I remember looking down, my legs are shaking. I had just had skin grafts uh, done, so the donor sites were on my thighs. I could see the, the, the bandages on my thighs start to turn red because the little blood vessels were starting to pop from all the strain. But I was still able to, to eke out that smile to my mom who was, who was recording it on her phone because uh, I was able to stand again for after four months and it just felt so good. And then, oh, thank you, thank you. And, and, it, and it was the support and the encouragement, you know, that, that kept me going. I could not have done this on my own. And then finally I got to return home. First thing I did was reunite with Angie, who my friends bought, brought back up from uh, San Antonio uh, to be with me. And she was there after every single surgery, crying with me at night making sure she never stepped on me, uh, and just being that, that comfort that I really needed during those lonely, isolating times. You know, I was 26 years old, young man, uh, had worked my whole life to, to move out of the house and start my own life, and there I was forced to live in the dining room of my mom's house. You know, not, not every young person's dream to have to move back in with mom, but uh, we developed an even stronger relationship that we had before, so I'm grateful for that, and Angie helped me through it. Uh, we'd eat our breakfast together in my, my new chair that some friends helped raise money for. She, she, mine's the oatmeal, hers is the, the bowl there. <laughs> she would always try to eat a little bit of mine. I never tried to eat her, but she was just my best friend. We were, you know, I'd had her for several years before, and, you know, gosh, I, 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 I really miss her a lot. Um, I said, my key's over there. I still have her dog tag uh, on my keys there. Uh, and there she is after more surgeries. Uh, I started doing physical therapy in my room. I couldn't really leave the house. I couldn't drive yet. Uh, but uh, the, the folks had donated a little exercise bike, so I'd sit there and just try to get my legs stronger uh, as long as my, my rear end would hold out because of how damaged it was. But I got stronger and stronger. I had this cape uh, that my therapist made for me. It says Super Andy on it. Uh, you know, they gave it to me on my graduation day, tied it to the back of my wheelchair, and said, you deserve this. We're so impressed. Just keep that spirit alive. So I would be there on my bike or on the ground doing, you know, my leg lifts and, and just remembering how far I've gone and all the people that helped me get there. And then, of course, Angie was always there to make sure I was doing okay. I took this picture of her when I was laying on the ground one time trying to do some sit-ups and just uh, that, that, that recovery atmosphere at home, just while I was very, very lonely, uh, it, was, it was what I needed to, to start to really move my life forward. And within a year, I had gotten into a new prosthetic for my right leg. I gathered all my friends and I walked the Macklin Mile in St. Louis. There am I, I still have my trach in my neck. Oh, thank you very, thank you so much. And again, this is a great accomplishment for me, but if you see, I could not have done it with all these amazing people around me, friends that I've had for years and years, family, and then some strangers who just saw me and said, they heard my story, can I walk with you? And it was just, a, it was a beautiful thing getting that to that finish line. It took me a long time, but I did it. And I didn't want that miracle to stop, so I kept moving, I kept pushing, I kept going to, to the gym to get stronger, uh, I kept walking further and further every day with Angie, uh, and within three years, uh, my story had, had gotten out there, not the, not the negative part of the story, but what I, what I had done to achieve, and what everybody had helped me do, and I got invited to something that every, I think, I would think every St. Louis kid uh, would, would dream of, and I got to go out there uh, August 13th, 2015, Bush Stadium, put my, my prosthetic toe on the rubber. And uh, what I did is I, I threw out what I call my no finger fastball. <laughs> it was a little high. Fredbert called it a strike, so I'm gonna defer to the expert. Uh, and it was, it was just a dream come true. Uh, 
it, I, I can't, uh, you know, one of the one of the most highlights of my life. I'd, I'd give it maybe number five because I am married and have three kids now. So I'll, I'll put it at, at, I'll put it at five, but uh, it was, and I'll show you a picture of my girls later. But it was just these these great things kept happening to me because people are so compassionate. You know, I, I, I've known a lot of people throughout my life and, and had great friends and caring, fr- you know, family. And, and, but strangers coming to my aid and supporting me and just being there for me for, for no absolute reason except because they care in their hearts. I mean, it, it, it helped me get to, get to these high points. And things just kept getting better. Like I said, I, uh, I, I ended up finishing that master's degree. I started a new project that I could do from home, graduated in 2015 on Mother's Day weekend nonetheless, so my mom got to sit there and watch her son walk across that stage when a few years back she was told he might not make it home with her. I kept going to the gym and training. I got with a personal trainer so I could really get back to to a level of fitness that I had before. I started running with Angie again and then getting into more smaller races like running 5Ks over at SLU. Uh, And then uh, not too long after after that, I met uh, an amazing person named Vanessa who one of my biggest fears throughout my recovery was, is anybody ever going to be able to love me? I'm damaged, I'm scarred both on the outside and on the inside. How is anybody going to want to be with me? But I met her, um, and I wouldn't have met her if, if all this wouldn't have happened to me. And she loves me for me. She not, not really looks past the scars and the damage, but but loves me for them and embraces them. And uh, several years ago, we got to uh, tie the knot at the St. Louis Zoo of all places uh, (laughs) because we met at a zoo. Uh, You know, I I spent my entire life at a zoo. My life is because of of my love for zoos. So there we were. Um, And then, uh, you know, over the years, she's blessed me with, with three beautiful girls. I have Lily in the middle. Rosalie on my lap and Laurel on on my wife's lap and Laurel's now about 19 months old. Rosie's almost four and Lily's a uh, six-year-old first grader. So, I mean, my life, you know, every every man's dream. I'm surrounded by beautiful women for the rest of my life, and uh, I owe it all to to all these people that helped me get through. And things went so well that on the 10 year anniversary of my very first marathon, the one I did even before I got hurt, I got to go back down to San Antonio, run that same course, and I ran that whole 26.2 miles. And, you know, luckily again, having the the story that I do, San Antonio News covered it, some folks I had developed a relationship over the years. And, And there I was running, crossing that finish line, you know, thinking about my girls and, and, you know, if, if anybody ever tells them they can't do anything, all they have to do is think of dad and say, you're wrong. I can do it. I'm strong enough. So I hope that, that my story just continuously inspires what, what they do in life. There's a few people I want to talk about uh, really quickly that, that embody why I'm able to achieve the things that I have. And it's Helen. I already told you a little bit about her. Uh, she's the nurse that I credit with my life. Uh, our, our last our daughter, Laurel, her middle name is Helen, uh, after this beautiful woman. But she's the one that really I, you know, not literally saved my life in the emergency department, but saved my life by getting me home to St. Louis, coming to my house, making sure, you know, first of all, you know, this, this, this beautiful, you know, Italian mama always bringing me fettuccine to keep, get me fatter. She'd pinch my cheek and, and tell me how beautiful I was. And it just, it, it just warmed my heart. And so there she was when I crossed that one year anniversary walk. She was there at my wedding. Uh, she also introduced me to this, this uh, handsome guy here, Tony, uh, a nurse who on his free time, and we were just talking about this with, with you over there, um, came to my house every day on his own accord, not getting paid for it to change my dressings, help me take a shower, but even more importantly, be a friend to me when I was isolated in my mom's house 24 hours a day. And a lot of my friends were in San Antonio. Uh, so he was there, uh, you know, these, these compassionate people. And then Dr. Bruce Kramer, who 
besides fixing me up, putting Humpty Dumpty back together, became such a good friend and a colleague. We actually traveled together quite a bit to give patient uh, doctor talks at different conferences. And one conference in Orlando, we even uh, decided to spend an extra day, go to Universal Studios and have a wizard's duel there on Diagon Alley for any of our Harry Potter fans. Uh, but it's just these people that, first of all, helped me achieve what I achieved, but also inspired me to, to not be selfish with what happened to me and keep it to myself, but but help others, take what I've had and what I've learned to, to serve uh, those who are in need. And that's when I, you know, I got the call from St. Louis University, uh, where I actually met Jennifer. I don't know if she's still in here. There she is. So we go way back uh, to my earlier days in SLU in 2015, um, where we met on the medical school campus. Uh, but I was invited. Uh, well, first, let me talk about this other compassionate guy, not a healthcare provider. Those people helped me and inspired me to serve. This guy not only inspired me to serve, but gave me the means to do it. This is Red McCombs, a uh, billionaire philanthropist from Texas, who for some reason was interested in helping me out. And when he heard about what I was trying to do at St. Louis University, he donated quite a bit of money uh, to let me do my role. And that's when we founded the Oberly Institute at St. Louis University, where I was asked to help lead this, this trauma support uh, program for, for other trauma survivors in, in our area. So what that really meant is first getting out in the community, telling my story, trying to meet those people who, uh, who, who need help and who could also help us out. Uh, I earned my master's degree in health administration because, you know, I had planned on scooping chimp poop the rest of my life. I had no idea how to be a healthcare leader, so I learned the skills to do that. Started meeting with patients, uh, being that peer support visitor for them and letting them know that I know what you're going through is difficult right now, but just hang in there. You can make it through, and I'm going to be here with you uh, as you go through it. So meeting more and more patients, both in the doctor's office, in the hospital, and being there even when my friend Jenna, for example, got to try on her prosthetic for the very first time. So developing the, these compassionate connections with people that helped them through their recovery, but also reminded me that I'm not alone in the struggles that I still have to this very day. Uh, and wanting to learn more and trying to, to build programs in a hospital, I knew I needed to learn more about data and research and how to make that case to, to hospital leadership. Started working on my doctorate in health management and policy. I'm almost finished with that. And finally, at, at St. Louis University several years ago, started the hospital's Trauma Survivors Network, uh, which is a pro multifaceted program that provides free services to patients, to families, uh, to help them on their own journeys uh, from surviving to thriving. I also started some programs at, at the university to help support our providers. You know, these folks see trauma every day, and it takes a major toll. And if our, trauma, if our trauma providers, if our healthcare providers are not fully supported, how are they going to make sure that we have the best care that we need? So we started a support program. So when they experience trauma in the line of work, we're there to respond and be there and let them, let them talk about it and have counselors there who can help them through their own struggles. So I started a pilot program at SLU. I'm now a, a, in the BJC system. I recently switched less than two months ago uh, to take on a, a bigger leadership role in, in, a ho in the hospital setting. Because uh, my ultimate goal is to be uh, the president of a hospital or a healthcare system because when I was in need, it was the president of SLU Hospital who against probably all the wisdom in the world and people telling, no, this kid is uninsured. He's going to need a lot of help. But Phil Soa, the president, said, we're going to bring him home. He needs it. And I want to be in the position one day to make that decision for others. So taking on these roles to help me get to that point where I have that ultimate authority to say, let's, let's help this individual. So now I'm also part of We Care at Barnes Jewish West County, where again, we're helping our providers uh, as they struggle through the hardships of being a healthcare provider, because it is not an easy job. I also host blood drives every year. I'm actually going to donate blood at uh, 3.30 this afternoon, but every year I hold a, a Trauma Survivors Day blood drive. This is from our last one in 2023. You know, my very first emergency surgery, I needed 20 units of blood just to keep me alive. So every goal I try to raise at least, every year I try to raise at least 20 units, uh, and these wonderful, generous people help me do it every year. 
But I've also used my voice and my platform and this great opportunity that I've been given to make, try to make even bigger change. I get to travel to Capitol Hill every year, meet with our, our leaders. There's me and, and uh, Missouri Senator Hawley telling him why he should help support a couple bills that, that are in place to give more money to the trauma system so we all have what we need, even if, like especially in places out here where, you know, Emergency departments and trauma centers are, are underfunded, and when they don't have all the support they need, you all don't have the support you need when, when one of you or your loved ones need that extra help. So there I am. I'm also on the board of directors for the American Trauma Society, which helps lead the way in helping improve trauma care across the entire United States. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm leading an initiative here in Missouri. Uh, I'm the, the state lead, and so everybody can move, which is a legislative effort in our state to help make sure that, that everybody, but especially little kids who need prosthetic devices, get access to them. Insurance won't cover uh, active, you know, active wear prosthetics for kids. So if they get something to help them walk, they can't have one that might be able to help them run. So we want to make sure that, that every kid has that opportunity to thrive. Uh, so I get, I'm leading this. We're still in the early infancy stages of this, of getting this going. But the congressional session for 2024, we're hoping to, to have our bill ready to, to present to, to the House of uh, Representatives here in Missouri in the Senate. So I really call on all of you just to, to keep, keep that miracle moving for everybody. Because when you provide that compassionate, compare, uh, compassionate care for people, you know, just by saying hello or, you know, just saying how are you, but, you know, you know, but saying it in a sincere way, you know, asking people to, you know, actually, how are you? That's when I was in the hospital, not one person asked if I wanted to talk about what had happened to me for the whole five months I was there. And how are you supposed to get through something when you can't talk about it? So, so be that open ear for people. Listen. And just, and just be there for each other. And, and when you're able to do that, you give people like me, you know, you know, you don't know what everybody's going through. I don't know what you all are going through. You know, raise your hand if you've survived the worst thing that's ever happened to you. You know, uh, we, exactly, we all go through trauma every day. You know, maybe it's not being attacked by chance, but... Whatever it is, we all struggle and we all need that support. We all need that compassion uh, and those connections from others. So be there to help somebody. Don't ever pass up that opportunity to, to help somebody because you don't know what they're going through. And just by saying hello or asking how they're doing could make a huge difference in their lives. And that's really my call to action to you all is just, you know, be, be there for each other and for your neighbors uh, because it can make stories like mine. Of course, I'm happy to. I'm happy to take questions uh, about anything. No, you know, uh, don't be shy. Um, yes, loud. yes. <laughs> yes. Is that very unusual for chimps to attack humans? And the second question would be: Did they do anything to the chimps? Thank you for the question. Uh, the first question was, is it rare for chimps to attack people? It is rather rare for chimps to attack people, mostly because when chimps are in a captive setting, they're really locked down. You know, if you go to the St. Louis Zoo, I've worked in zoos since I was eight, you know, 15 years old. Chimpanzees are one of the most locked down, secured animals in the entire zoo because not only are they strong, but they're also very smart and curious. And you will actually, I've seen chimps, you know, take sticks and try to, Jimmy their, their, their locks on their cages because they watch their, their keepers do it. So they, they try things like that. And I mean, they can climb and they can get out. Um, so uh, it is very rare, but you know, I'm always, I always tell people any primate, but especially chimps do not make good pets. You know, there's, there's a uh, lot of stories out there of people. Uh, there's a, you know, a, a story of a woman years and years ago whose friend uh, had a pet chimp and it ended up tearing her face and her hands off. Uh, so they're strong and they can turn on you. They're wild animals. Um, so, it, but it is rare. You don't hear about it often. I've uh, only know of a few other people who have actually had that attack. I've known a lot of zookeepers who work with chimps who are missing a finger or two because they get close to the chimps. You know, I love them. I have no hard feelings against them. I'm glad to answer your second question if anything happened to those two chimps. 
they did nothing to them. And that was actually one of my first thoughts when I kind of came to and woke up from that coma. Uh, was I, I hope they didn't do anything to Nikki and Amadeus because they were just being who they are. Um, you know, it was just unfortunate that, that the electric fencing that separated us that day couldn't, didn't hold them back. Uh, but, uh, but they are dangerous animals. So having, you know, having close proximity with them, as long as you're protected, you know, everything's going to be okay. But, yeah, you know, don't have, you're welcome. Don't have them in your homes. <laughs> uh, yes. They do have tours there still. Yes, they do. Uh, the, to my knowledge, from what I've from what I've learned, uh, they don't go up to that all adult enclosure where where all this happened to me. There's two other enclosures where I spent my time that had adult and juveniles, which is kind of what my research was was around. So, I didn't make it up to that adult enclosure often, uh, which is why you know they they probably felt you know felt I was a stranger because I I didn't know them very well. I'm you know my, my guess is that if I would have spent a lot of time up there as well, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Here in the front. Maybe I missed it, but you said you were going to tell us about your finger. Oh yes, yes. Well, I, I kind of mentioned, you know, the the finger that did save is the one uh, my wife was able to put a ring on in our wedding. Uh, yeah, yes. So you know, you know, he works in mysterious ways, and why why they saved me my uh, my video game and my. Uh, <laughs> My, my, my wedding finger is, you know, just another part of that miracle that, uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, and I, my, my grandpa was there. I, I wear a pendant that, uh, it's the miraculous medal that uh, he wore his whole life. When he passed away, my mom gave it to me. I was wearing it the day of the attack. Uh, you know, I remember looking down at one point. Everything had been ripped off of me except my belt. My boots were gone. My pants were gone. My shirt was gone. I didn't see the chain, I didn't see the pendant, but when my mom was sitting in the hospital with me, you know, several weeks after all that happened, uh, she told me this story that um, when she talked to the paramedics, she asked about if they, if they found a necklace with me, and they said, yes, ma'am, we have it here, it's with his things. Uh, the chain was broken, but when we recovered him, it was still stuck to his chest. So my grandpa was there keeping me alive that day. Uh, he, he fought hard. Yeah, that, you know, my guardian angel is, is definitely my grandpa. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes? While you were doing the tour, and the chips escaped, mm -hmm. did they attack any other tour people? They, the, they did not attack anybody else. Uh, I, was, I was probably a good 20 feet or so from the group when, when this all happened. Um, uh, because the chimps were starting to like lob things over the fence, like like they do, you know. Uh, and so the the, the tourists were kind of standing back. And I remember uh, one of the last things I saw before the attack happened was them kind of diving headfirst under the fence and running towards me. I had enough time and told the told the group to run. And then that's when I got tackled from behind. So I'm not sure what what they did afterwards, except I know that they went and found the people who were able to eventually help me. Yes. Can you still go to the zoo to see the chimp? Oh, we are St. Louis Zoo members, proud. Uh, and that's one of the first places I try to go. Now my daughters kind of get to dictate where we go first, but I always try to visit our chimps. If you haven't gone recently, we have a baby chimp who is the cutest thing in the world. I have no hard feelings to get to chimps. I have pictures of them on my desk because they are still such a big part of my life. They always have been. They always will be. And again, they were just being chimps. So, you know. When the big guys come up to the glass, my heart still does, you know, kind of start to beat a little faster. But I know I'm safe, and over the years, I've been able to, you know, develop some techniques to help me get back into a calmer space and just, you know, let those, you know, more fearful uh, thoughts and emotions kind of just float away. Yes, way in the back there. My question is more in regards to your comment about asking people how they are doing. When you come up to someone and they've had some Sure, sure. So it's definitely different, you know, in, in the setting that I've been able to do it a lot, which is in the hospital. Uh, so I am able to talk a little bit more. But, you know, my, my kind of my, my advice is when you're out and about, you know, just 
just say how you're doing. If that person, you know, wants to talk more about, uh, you know, and a lot of times trauma is, is invisible. We can't see it. You know, people are suffering on the inside or, you know, a lot of people times when I would walk into a room, they couldn't tell that I had been in an accident because they didn't see my prosthetic at first. They weren't focusing on seeing my hands and, you know, really didn't notice the scars. But so you don't know what anybody's going through. So my advice is really, you know, just ask how they're doing. If, if they want to open up, uh, then, then they will. And a lot of times, you know, when you're sincere about it, when you, you know, I know a lot of us, when we see people, you know, out and about, and we walk past and say, hi, how are you doing? You know, you kind of just keep walking, but you don't really stop to, to look them in the eyes when you ask them that question and be there to listen. And I think people can really tell when, when you do sincerely want to know how they're doing. You know, instead of, of saying it in passing, you kind of stop and, you know, how are you? And really show that you are, you do want to hear them. Uh, so that, that's really my advice. But, uh, you know, if, but if you do see somebody who, you know, is, is, you know, visibly, you know, physically traumatized, you know, with, with amputations or things like that or in a wheelchair, you know, it's, I, my advice is to let them be the ones to, to talk about it first. Don't, you know, some, some, I don't mind when people come up to me and say, you know, hey, what, what happened to you? I've had, that's happened to me a lot. Uh, but other people don't uh, like that. They don't like being singled out. So it's, I think you're always on the safer side to just you know, say, hey, how are you doing? And if they want to talk, then they will. Time for one more. Yes. So 28 surgeries. Yes. Have you had, do you continue to have surgeries? My last surgery was probably in 20, I'd say 2017. Uh, so five years uh, post, post all this happening. Uh, and it was just a little bit. I started not being able to hear out of my right ear. The scar tissue was kind of building up. So my doc, Bruce Kramer, went in and just kind of took out a lot of that scar tissue, opened my ear canal back up. But I haven't had any more surgeries since, and I don't plan on it. Uh, but, you know, I was actually just in the hospital uh, for a couple nights about three weeks ago. Uh, because because of my injuries on my foot and my prosthetic and my activity level, uh, I had this open wound on my foot and ended up getting a pretty gnarly uh, infection, cellulitis, that went all the way up my leg. Uh, you know, the oral antibiotics wouldn't take care of it, so I ended up in the ER uh, and then in the hospital for a couple days. At the hospital I work, so I really got to see what the patient experience is like there from the inside, do a little secret shopping, and, and really... Um, uh, get you know was treated very very well. It, it was a, but I'm always going to have issues given given my amputations and and, and limitations. But um, you know that's why I still try to you know I'm, I'm training for an Ironman right now, uh, triathlon. My goal is to do that by 2025 uh, before I turn 40 years old uh, in 26. So your skin graft we can't see it a lot. Oh yeah, I got, I got a bunch of them. Yeah, and on your face, I mean, you look amazing. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah. Bruce Kramer. Amazing. He's retired, though, so I'm sorry that he's out of commission for anybody else. Did the chimps save enough of your skin that your skin could be grafted, or did you have to have Yes, there, were, there was enough skin. Enough skin. There was enough skin left on my body to to save for grafts. Mostly, all my donor sites were really from the front of my thighs. Uh, and a lot, you know, the reason that skin was really saved is because I curled up in that ball as much as I could, and so it saved that little bit of my skin uh, that that was then able to to be taken for grafts, you know, on, on my rear end, on my lower legs, on my arms, uh, on my sides, and everything like that. And you said your scalp. They yes. Scalp. Yes. Yes. But uh, Bruce Kramer uses. Uh, to help grow a lot of my scalp back and some of this this skin, he had this great uh, product that he uses. We call it magic fairy dust, but uh, it's really from a pig's bladder, and it uh, helped promote normal site-specific tissue healing. And it actually grew normal skin back that allowed uh, you know hair follicles to grow, sweat glands to grow, which is that they actually used uh, to rebuild my nose. Uh, is is from my forehead. Uh, so I actually had to have laser hair removal because it was starting to grow this thick, curly, brown <laughs> stuff out of it. Um, I mean, <laughs> no, no, no. But it, it's, it's been a journey. I've learned a lot. But uh, the, the most important thing I learned is, is compassion can make anything possible. Always remember that. Always be kind and, and be there for others. 
Thank you.